This is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. This is Alex Tapscott here with co-host Andrew Young. Today, we're talking about something pretty interesting. It's going to be a, a discussion around scalability and then a transition into a, a talk about the SX Network, the project that Andrew and his partner, Jake Hanna, have spearheaded. And we're very fortunate to have Jake on here today. So here's the purpose of the podcast. As we've talked about in the past, scaling blockchains has been one of the uh, limiting factors, I think, of DeFi growth. And we've seen Ethereum become a victim of its own success. And as a result, other you know new emerging protocols trying to capture market share. What we haven't spent a lot of time talking about yet is the idea of a, a layer two, um, basically something built on top of Ethereum that can allow it to grow. And one of the most exciting layer two blockchain uh, solutions is Polygon. And it's been in the, ruse, in the news recently, excuse me, um, as many more projects look to basically scale on top of Ethereum. Sandeep Nailwall, who is the co-founder of Polygon, um, recently talked a little bit about the Polygon SDK, which is a software development kit, uh, which enables projects to build their own uh, Ethereum-compatible blockchains with Polygon. One of the sort of darlings of the Polygon network is, in fact, the SX network. Um, one of the applications that I think has shown the strongest product market fit and has really leveraged that platform. So we're excited today to have Jake Hanna, who is the COO and the co-founder of SX Network, who along with Andrew Young, our co-host and the CEO and co-founder of SX Network as well, to talk about the project with me. So really, we're going to let Andrew and Jake kind of spearhead this discussion. Um, maybe, Andrew, starting with you, I remember we were talking about um, blockchain scaling problems you know about a year ago actually and you were um telling me about some of the solutions that you were looking at at the time for sportx the precursor to sx network and how did you land on on polygon exactly and what problems does that solve and how does that i don't know act as a model maybe for other projects in the space yeah for sure thanks alex so we, we actually have a very unique experience uh, and firsthand sort of look at all the scaling solutions because um, we've built the largest blockchain prediction market in the world uh, called Sportex. And it was initially deployed on Ethereum back in March, 2019. And back then transaction costs were very low, sort of a typical transaction on Ethereum would cost maybe five to 10 cents and which was which was sort of uh, viable for our use case. But as uh, the sort of DeFi summer got going, which was essentially uh, last summer, uh, the fees on Ethereum have just exploded. And uh, for a project like uh, for prediction market, the average relative transaction size is actually quite small uh, relative to something like a, a decentralized exchange or a, a token lending platform. Mm. And so as as fees kind of went from five to 10 cents to 50 to hundred dollars. And today they're 500 to a thousand dollars. We were sort of forced to deploy uh, SportX on a new blockchain. And uh, so about 14 months ago, we essentially run the gauntlet and looked at uh, and due to diligence and researched and interviewed uh, pretty much all of the major blockchain projects uh, for us to deploy on. We talked to the Solana team. Uh, we talked to Polygon. We talked to the Near Protocol. Uh, we talked to pretty much uh, every team in the space. And what became apparent to us really quickly on was that uh, Polygon, that used to be called Matic, uh, was the number one solution for us to go on because it was the only solution that was actually live yet. And on top of that, it was the only solution that to us had both sort of scalability, but then also the requisite amount of decentralization to really be a viable network to build on. And so Jake and I, uh, we researched all these teams and we decided on uh, Polygon. And, um, and, and essentially SportX has been on Polygon since then. And, uh, and, and I can talk a little bit about what we're doing nowadays, but um, it's, been, it's been quite a process. And uh, Jake, what, what stood out to you sort of going through that process 
when we researched all these different chains as well? Yeah, um, an important part of Polygon was that they were actually tied to Ethereum scaling, where most other chains like Solana aren't actually tying their security to Ethereum, which means that they don't actually checkpoint their transactions on ETH. When Polygon, every hour or so, they will like, combine all of these transactions on Polygon and then actually confirm that on Ethereum. So you have the speed and transaction cost of layer two with the security ending up on Ethereum. I think that was very important to us was to have everything tied back to ETH and to scale on a platform that is built actually on top of ETH rather than competing. Jake, do you think of this sort of like batch processing or sort of like netting in traditional financial terms where like, yeah, you know, you've got exactly. a bunch of stuff that's kind of happening and then, you know, you, you, you don't clearance like a trading desk doesn't you know clear and settle every trade it batches them and then nets them at the end of the day like is that sort of how you think about layer two for our traditional financial audience yes exactly so that is what polygon does that exact um process they would take you know all of the transactions over the past hour and instead of posting each individual transaction that each person did over that hour they would only post the net change which the result is the exact same so yeah. in the last couple of weeks we've had, last month, I would say, we've had a lot of folks from new layer ones. We had, um, you know, Avalanche, Cosmos, uh, Bancor. These are new per se, but, you know, these are things that are different from Ethereum, I guess, who have been mm -hmm. um, talking about the benefits of their platform um, over others. I think probably Avalanche would be the one that's specifically saying, like, we are better than Ethereum for the following reasons, right? Um, but we've also seen, and, and they've had a lot of success, but we've also seen uh, Polygon having a ton of success as an L2. So are we just in this experimentation mode where we're kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall and trying different things? Or is this the future where we're gonna have lots of layer ones and lots of layer twos? And, you know, Av is Avalanche only successful now because it's not popular enough? And when it becomes popular, will it need its own layer twos? Like, how do you think about, I don't want to get too, into the word salad here, but like, how do you think about those different scaling issues? Yeah, um, yeah, I can, I can sort of uh, take that question actually. The way I think Jake, Jake and I, are, I think, are pretty aligned on how we see the space uh, growing. I th we sort of split the world into EVM chains and non-EVM chains. So uh, EVM essentially just means Ethereum virtual uh, machine, and uh, chains like Avalanche. Are actually EVM chains. So if you deploy your applicate your decentralized application on Ethereum or Polygon, you can actually also deploy your application on something like Avalanche. Um, and that's in contrast to something like Solana or EOS, where you actually have to rebuild your whole infrastructure to mm -hmm. to actually sort of deploy your application on Solana. It's kind of like a Android versus iPhone in a way. And so I think what's kind of happening is more, there's kind of two trends. So the first trend is a lot of the EVM market share is slowly moving to networks like Polygon, uh, Avalanche, because they have cheaper fees um, and they have kind of their own native applications. And it's, and, and obviously there's a lot of exciting things happening there, but then on the, while that's happening, there's also a, a almost like a completely new, set of applications uh, being built on Solana, um, which is which you, you sort of need to build the whole thing in Rust. And so you're seeing sort of this bifurcation of the industry a little bit where um, there's kind of an EVM side and then there's a non EVM side, which is really dominated by Solana. Uh, whether those two sides, yeah. merge, whether those sides merge is, is interesting. Uh, Charlie on our last podcast was talking about how a project's building an EVM sort of uh, a way for EVM applications to deploy on Solana, but um, sorry, Jake, what, what were you, what were you thinking? Oh yeah, no, I, I, I feel that same way. And I think that all EVM compatible chains are actually in some way valuable to the Ethereum ecosystem because they all will actually end up being bridged across all these EVM chains. It's very easy to hop between Polygon, Avalanche, SX chain, and all that. 
And I think that's the way that EVM will scale. The developer tooling, the ERC-20 token standard, all of that has seemed to take and hold. And being able to be part of that EVM world, I think, is super important. The problem with Avalanche is absolute, not problem, but apps that deploy on Avalanche have to rely at their base on Avalanche's security, which is not as high as Ethereum. Well, they have a very, they have about the same transaction speed and actually a higher cost than Polygon per transaction. Polygon does benefit by checkpointing or batching all of those transactions on ETH for that added layer of security. So let's talk about SX because we're talking about basically a stack here where we've got, people can't see my hands if they're listening to the podcast, but the bottom is Ethereum <laughs> layer one. And then you've got Polygon layer two. This is how we do netting or batching so that we can speed up transactions and reduce costs, right? And then on top of that, you've got the SX network. Now, before the SX network was SportX, which was a um, you know prediction market used in the sports betting space where um, you had a native token that acted sort of like a, you know, a loyalty point or exchange token. I don't know how you want to describe it exactly, but it could be, it had useful usefulness within the app. But now as the SX network is becoming its own blockchain, um, and so now we've got like chain on chain on chain. And it's like, how do, how does the average person like make, make sense of all of this? Why? Like, in other words, okay, we understand what the layer one is. It's the, it's the anchor. And then you've got the layer two, which helps it scale. What's the purpose of SX network as its own blockchain? So I can kind of touch on why. And that's because um, from the time that we joined Polygon to today, transaction fees have gone up 25,000 times. Um, just an absolutely staggering jump is we were, were the third ever DAP on Polygon. And you know, like, even though transactions are still only a penny or two on Polygon, you know, they're not an unconceivable jump away from a few dollars per transaction. And for an app like SportX, which relies heavily on sports betting, which is an average transaction size of 10 to $30, a small bet becomes impossible even with a dollar or two in transaction fees. And we see Polygon kind of being a hub on top of Ethereum, where all of these chains will spoke off of with the Polygon SDK and they will scale Polygon. So we are actually gonna be batching and checkpointing all of our transactions on Polygon, which will then batch them on Ethereum. So we will have a layer of speed on top of Polygon with cheaper transactions but we still get the benefit in the end of Ethereum's security. So, so Jake, you talked about the, how all this works, um, but ultimately we're still in the yeah. EVM world. So for something like SportX, for example, don't you want it to be available on every blockchain so that people who are maybe Solana users and, you know, cause they're new to blockchain, they maybe skip the Ethereum stage altogether in their own mind. Uh, want to you know use the app? Is that still possible, or like how does that work? So they would have to bridge. But the th th thing is, there's so many high quality br bridge pr protocols being built currently that it is very easy to go from any kind of EVM chain to Polygon to FX network or to Ethereum. And w one thing that we've kind of seen over the past three four months is over half of the users who've signed up for SportX in the past four months haven't ever touched Ethereum. They come straight to Polygon and they live their entire crypto life on Polygon or on a layer two. Mm. They might hop between Avalanche and Polygon or SX chain or all of that, but they don't ever touch ETH. And I actually think in five years, people won't believe you when you tell them that you did a transaction on the base layer Ethereum. I think that's actually okay. Cause I can see a, a time where ETH fees continue to rise to five, even $10,000 per transaction. And then it's just chains like Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, SX network that are batching and checkpointing transactions on, on ETH. And 
I think currently Polygon spends millions of dollars a month in gas fees on those checkpoints. And I think that, um, you know, that will become the trend is that all of these layer two chains will just be bashing and paying millions of dollars in transaction fees for the users on their chain. Can you think of an analogy in the real world that mm, would make sense to our listeners when you, you know, you've got this base layer? Yeah. You, all of these layer twos, yeah. is, it, is it almost like, I don't know, like the Fed wire system in the US and then a bunch of correspondent banks on top who are all transacting yeah each other. it's almost and settling like to that, like this yeah. thing is that like a way to think about it and then and so i want you to answer that question but i also want to sort of raise a, a criticism which is what are we doing here are we just recreating some sort of ver version of of the old system where you've got you know this sort of base layer and then a bunch of different things on top and everything's siloed and it feels like the old system how do you how I do you respond the, to that <laughs> Yeah, I think the first thing to say is your example of the Fed works perfectly that, you know, um, there will be ETH and you'll see massive, almost like central banks, they will be the ones transacting on Ethereum. Um, but the one change is, is that Ethereum isn't the Fed. Ethereum is a decentralized protocol that people can trust. It's not 10 people who meet quarterly. I guess sure to a certain extent, there's a, there's a, there is a couple, there is maybe 10 or 12 core developers, but they don't have the same power that uh, the, the Fed. Yeah. Who's yeah. the J who's the J pow of Ethereum? <laughs> yeah. Vitalik is, he's going to, yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I do think, so, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. I do think, I think that's a great example of how it's sort of built. I also think, I think of these networks almost as their own sort of digital economies. So in a way they're, rather than almost like a fed wire and then sort of schedule one or tier one banks. Um, it's sort of like the U S dollar reserve currency. And then these sort of separate um, sort of uh, the same way developing countries sort of peg their currency to the U S dollar. And, and, and at the end of the day, sort of leverage the le legitimacy and liquidity of the U S dollar. It's, it's somewhat like that as well. I guess it's kind of a mix of the two. Um, and what's interesting is DeFi. Um, Cause when you think about it that way, it makes sense that all of these different blockchains have their own DeFi applications, the same way that sort of countries have their own banking systems and uh, and sort of their own country specific industries. Uh, and so that's why I do think each of these blockchains, at least these sort of the top 50 to 100 are going to have sort of their own uh, DeFi, NFT, uh, gaming sort of applications. Uh, but with that being said, I do think certain networks will have sort of competitive advantages within certain industries the same way that, yeah exactly the same way that countries do mm -hmm. it's kind of like the hub and the spoke model where ethereum is the hub and then polygon may actually become a hub as well with a ton of spokes off of it and each chain based on what's happening on that chain doesn't need the same security speed or transaction advantages like a chain that is more focused on gaming. Or sorry, I got caught up there. A chain more focused on gaming could be, um, or does not require as much um, security, especially if the average transaction size is pennies in like a pay for play game. They just need speed and scale. When right. any, any chain that handles banking or high value transactions that like all day is on with billions of dollars locked up, they need it to be more secure and they don't need transactions to be instant. So for the SX network, you talked about how sports betting is typically small dollar value is the vision for the SX network that it can be used for all kinds of small dollar value um applications is that the idea so is it sports betting play to earn like all that stuff or is 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 there more to it than that so i think i think so, we, start, yeah, we, start, yeah. we started off with the vision of building out sx network for sort of the prediction market and gaming use case um but as we've sort of been doing business development we and we have sort of uh 25 projects that are going to be launching on sx network with a sort of another 30 or 40 that we're talking to in our pipeline and the sort of it, the focus definitely shifted. 
So the first sort of five to 10 projects were mostly prediction market related, but increasingly we're getting lots and lots of interest from sort of standard DeFi applications and uh, NFT, there's a couple of NFT projects we're talking to and sort of gaming, uh, gaming projects. And so I do think that while I think we're, we sort of have a competitive advantage within that sort of specific vertical, um, we, it does seem like there's a lot of growth kind of all across the board. Um, would you sort of agree mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, I'd say we've been kind of targeting a middle road where we aren't trying to do a block every tenth of a second, more every one to two seconds because that's all the speed that you actually need for sports betting as um, one to two seconds is totally fine. Same with for NFTs or daily fantasy sports. Um, so that has kind of been our niche is, is a very fast transaction time, but not instant. When a chain like Axie, Axie Infinity with their Ronin chain, they need a block every 10th of a second because they, it's, it's, it's a live worldwide multiplayer game. Right. So, and, and just to kind of, um, I think it's, it's sort of key to, to, to realize that there's, there's a spectrum of sort of decentralization and security on one side and then scalability and sort of um, uh, cheapness or whatever you want to call it, price on the other. And um, there's going to be a number of different chains that emerge that sort of dial that, uh, dial those two knobs to fit their specific use mm -hmm. case, but in the process also sort of um, have the space and capacity to sort of handle these other applications. Well, that's the question I have, which is, you know, in, in Axie, the Axie example, um, you know, for people mm -hmm. who aren't aware, Axie is a, like a play to earn game where you control this avatar in Axie, which you have to buy, uh, incidentally, and then you can earn in-game rewards, which are fungible, so you can, you know, monetize them. Um, and that's become massively popular. I think there are 2.5 million people who've played the game in the last 30 days, and they've cleared billions of dollars of transactions. So this is like a really big thing. And it they just closed a massive funding round, too. Anyway. Um, um, so, you know, that's small dollar value, but it, but it could be a lot bigger. And I think about sports betting, for example, like someone could put a million dollar bet on, on the outcome of a game. So like the speed component remains important, but the security does as well, right? Because you're talking about lots of money um, at stake. Um, so, you know, I know I, I'm not suggesting that you guys are compromising one for the other, but I just want to understand how you think about that as, as you're as the as the the application and applications on the network become more popular the dollar value goes up right so yeah i think that's actually that is correct um but i think one thing that people uh haven't really been sort of looking forward past kind of the next six to 12 months uh, and i'm not i'm not accusing you of this but i think one thing that is going to happen sort of naturally is that um and whether this is sort of good for UX or not is, is another question, but it's highly likely that the sort of each chain is gonna build more and more layers on top of it. So what I mean by that, um, if you look at something like Avalanche, they they know that they're sort of their base layer L1 can only handle a certain amount of throughput. So they've already planned for this with uh, this idea of subnets, uh, which is essentially like a side chain uh, where different side chains can build on top of the sort of base layer uh, avalanche L1. L1, yeah. And so I do think there's there's kind of two competing visions within the, the sort of the space. There's the vision that we're going to scale vertically, um, which is sort of now dominated by sort of Ethereum and Pol uh, Polygon, Polkadot on one side. And then there's this sort of uh, competing vision, which is that we're all going to be on the same sort of base layer which is what Solana is trying to build. Hmm. I think Jake and I are very much in sort of the former camp rather than the latter, but, uh, and that's again, it's interesting because that's also split the way between sort of non EVM and, and Rust as well. So yeah, I, exactly. So it is a kind of a very interesting uh, approach to the, the whole space between Solana and uh, non Solana, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really tough to know sort of how the space is gonna evolve. It's, it's definitely something that we're, keeping on track, keeping track of every day though. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, in the example yeah, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. Like, um, yeah, sorry, in the example of like a massive bet on FX network, 
we still are then tied to the Polygon chain for security and the ETH chain for security when a chain like Avalanche would not, not be. So Avalanche like avalanche is going to have to become a secure layer one with very high transaction fees. That's the only way that, that they can handle tens of, or even the billion dollar transactions. And the advantage of all these chains on top is that you can scale without compromising security. That's kind of why we believe in the vertical approach that Andrew talked about. Yeah. And I think one last thing to add there is you're already starting to see it, uh, Transaction costs on Avalanche are now sort of in the one to two dollar range during sort of periods of congestion, and so um, I don't think uh, like that sort of scalability advantage that they're sort of proposing isn't uh, may not actually be sort of a long longer term uh, sort of longer term competitive advantage. But with that being said, as transaction fees go up, it obviously hurts the UX to a certain extent, but it makes the network far more valuable because it, uh, it's sort of a, to a certain extent, it's loosely correlated with the security of the chain as well. So as sort of, as you become, as the transaction costs go up, assuming you sort of have, uh, assuming you have more than sort of one transaction per second or something uh, very, un- unless you're sort of artificially constraining supply, but as transaction costs go up, the security of the base layer goes up, which then makes it more attractive for other layer twos or side chains to build on top of you. Um, yeah, I think that the comment there is basically, you know, any new L1 is going to be fast and cheap because no one's using it. Um, but yeah, exactly. the second it becomes popular, the fees go up because there is a there is a constraint on how much can be done on any given L1, right? And maybe some are designed better and more efficiently from the outset, but it's obvious that, that these kinds of different scaling solutions are going to be needed. Uh, we've we've This is kind of technical, but we've actually had a a few different technical conversations and viewers have really liked them because there's a lot of confusion about this. I mean, a lot of people see Bitcoin and and Ethereum, and those are the only two things. And they wonder like, what else is out there? And really the key thing is that, you know, all of these different kinds of of applications in DeFi and in other areas, whether it's play to earn or NFTs are running on top of general purpose blockchains. Ethereum was the first, but it's it's not the only one. There are these other versions and all are trying to figure out these different issues, right? Um, of how to scale efficiently and, and effectively. All I can say, uh, you know, is that the proof is in the pudding um, when it comes to Ethereum, which is that uh, all of the <laughs> um, most innovative projects began there. Um, we're starting to see innovation elsewhere, but. Uh, Ethereum still dominates in DeFi, dominates in NFTs, it dominates in, in many other areas. And in your case, I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, SportX, since launching on Polygon, has just continued to explode in growth. Um, you know, every week you guys are beating the previous week's record in terms of transaction volumes and so forth. And value is clearly accruing to the token um, SX as well, which is, I think, evidence that um, you guys have made a good decision here, and I'm curious to see how the how things react when when you know SX network launches, um, you know, as its own a blockchain as well. So, anyway, I think it's a really fascinating discussion. It's one where I at least, you know, I think everyone has to have a view. I try to be not agnostic, but but humble in the face of a lot of uncertainty. And I think at this stage, like there is a lot that's. TBD when it comes to all of this stuff. Um, you know, I think that if you listen to Sonny Agarwal or Ethan Buckman, who we've had both had in the podcast from the sort of Cosmos network perspective, um, you know, their view is sort of, it's not about which one blockchain, it's about how we connect them all together because we're going to need as many as we can get basically um, to, to if this is going to really reach its potential. Um, I, I'm slightly partial to that view, but um, all of them are, are pretty compelling. So I think that's it in terms of uh, questions for the pod. Uh, Andrew, do you want to wrap this one up? Yeah, I think uh, just to kind of build off your last point, first of all, thanks thanks again to Jake for hopping on this podcast. Uh, it's great to, great to tag team it with, yeah. uh, with Alex. Um, I'll just leave it with sort of one thing that Andreessen Horowitz uh, sort of said. Uh, their whole motto is that software is eating the world. And they put out sort of a, a piece saying that block space is the most scarce resource in the world. And there's going to be exploding demand for it for the next sort of 10 to 20 years. And if you just let, kind of look at the 
uh, smart contract space, you're seeing that across the board. Um, you're looking at Polygon kind of seeing 25,000 X growth in transaction fees in the course of 14 months. Uh, it's just kind of evidence of how much underlying demand and growth there is um, for sort of an industry that's trying to remake uh, the internet, the financial system and, and culture through sort of NFT. Uh, there's, just, there's just so much demand uh, and we're still kind of constrained by supply. So I'm definitely excited about uh, all these different networks that are launching. We're super excited about what we're doing with SX Network. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having both of us, I guess, on the show. Well, you're the host. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> But yes, you were you were you were playing a, a dual role in uh, yeah, was, on the podcast. Yeah, Jake, thanks exactly. for joining us. It's great, great discussion. Um, so, yeah. if people want to learn more about SX Network um, to understand all this stuff, where should they go? Who should they follow? Sorry, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I think you can, uh, you can check out our site, uh, sx.technology. Um, you can also check out SportX, which is sportx.bet, uh, which is sort of the flagship application that's being built, uh, that's already built and live and, and sort of the largest blockchain prediction market in the world now by volume. Um, and then besides that, uh, you can follow myself and Jake on Twitter. We'll put the bios in the description. All right. Well, that concludes today's episode of DeFi Decoded. We've got a great um, end of the year in terms of guests. Some very special people will be joining to wrap it up. Um, this is another great edition, though. Number 22 for us. Um, who knew it was going to last like that long? I feel like we're just getting started, too. So thanks, Jake. Thanks, Andrew. We'll see you next time. Take care. Of course, Alex. Thanks, guys. Bye. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.